He is the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. Millions of followers believe he is the Messiah. I just remember as being big and powerful and charismatic and kicking and thumping his hands and waving his hands as he spoke. I just knew him as the Messiah. I was in awe. They are told they are saving the world, but they're really just building Moon's financial empire. Feed them cheaply, house them cheaply, get them out in a van, do the fundraising, maximize the profit over them, and just constantly keep, keep the money flowing. This is the story of Reverend Moon, told by ex-members of his Unification Church. I was a terrible fundraiser, just absolutely terrible, because I'm shy, and I would start thinking things like, why do we need money? What is the money for? They gave up everything for Reverend Moon. Was it a benevolent religion or malignant cult? Let me tell you really clearly, it is a cult. It is dangerous. It is intoxicating. It is extremely difficult to leave. It's a joyous day at RFK Stadium. Over 28,000 couples are about to be married at the same time. Presiding over the ceremony is the Korean minister, the Reverend Sung Myung Moon. These are arranged marriages for these couples. They are all members of the Unification Church and the matches have been handpicked by Reverend Moon himself. The mass wedding is called a blessing, and this is the pinnacle for followers of the church, a cleansing of evil spirits. And supposedly by getting this ceremony, you are magically rendered immune to these spirits bothering you. Oh, the blessing will cure everything. No matter what your problem is, once you go through the blessing, you go through the holy wine ceremony, and then you do the big wedding, bingo, all your problems are gone. Your psychological, emotional, spiritual troubles will evaporate. Yolande Brenner celebrated a similar wedding at Olympic Stadium in Seoul, South Korea. She's a devoted follower, but she has complicated feelings about marrying a man who is essentially a stranger. On some level, I was hopeful, and on another level, I just felt strange because I mean, we hadn't had any contact or conversation, really, or any type of intimacy whatsoever. The unusual ceremony is just another area of members' lives that is totally controlled by Reverend Moon. You would marry who he said to marry. You would live with your spouse if he said so. And so this was the kind of controlled existence that members of the Unification Church lived. Every area of their life was controlled by Reverend Moon and the leaders of the church. Sun Myung Moon is born in North Korea in 1920. From a very early age, he claims to be clairvoyant and can see the future. At age 15, he hikes into the mountains on Easter Sunday morning to pray and says that he sees Jesus in a cloud he claims Jesus tells him to take over his unfinished mission. Reverend Moon's claim that he is the Messiah, that he is going to fulfill what Jesus failed to do, which is bring the world to peace and unify the world under one belief system, of course, that being his and he being the leader. And that is why they call it the Unification Church. Moon claims he later has spiritual encounters with Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, and other religious prophets. In 1948, Reverend Moon tries to preach Christianity in North Korea, but he's arrested by the communist government. He's accused of spying for South Korea and put in a prison camp. In the camp, Moon is subjected to brainwashing techniques, 
methods he later incorporates into the indoctrination programs of the Unification Church. Reverend Moon himself learned about what we call thought reform or what many people would call brainwashing by being in a North Korean POW camp. And when you look at the structure and, and the programming, the, the schedule within these indoctrinational camps that Reverend Moon created, you realize he's doing it. He's doing what the North Koreans did. During the Korean War, Moon escapes to South Korea and establishes his Unification Church in 1954. His theology is a mix of Christianity, Confucianism, shamanism, and anti-communist rage. Moon is married, but it is said that he sleeps with young women followers to purify them. In 1960, he divorces his first wife and marries his cook's daughter, Hak Ja Han, who is 23 years younger than Moon. In 1957, his book, The Divine Principle, is published, and it becomes the guiding text of the church. And The Divine Principle is his book, which basically is all about how he is the true father, true parent, and he is the Messiah that will save the world. Moon states, the fall of man began in the Garden of Eden when Eve tasted the forbidden fruit. He explains that all love relationships are imperfect because Adam and Eve did not wait for God to bless their union. Instead, Eve had sex with Lucifer and then with Adam before she came of age. Being blessed in the Unification Church can erase the evils brought by this original sin. So Reverend Moon and Hak Jahan, his wife, are the new true parents, and they're gonna have children, the true children, and bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so when couples were blessed, matched, and then blessed in marriage by Reverend Moon, their children would be blessed children, and they were born without original sin. The church spreads throughout Asia, and by 1970, there are thousands of members known as Moonies. In 1971, Moon moves to the United States. He believes success in America will propel him to world power. He arrives at a time of political turmoil and American cities filled with vulnerable teenagers searching for meaning in their lives. Recruiters for the church target tourist areas and college campuses. The Moonies are extremely open and friendly. They invite young men and women to attend an intriguing seminar. In 1976, Gordon Neufeld, a young Canadian, decides to take a two-week vacation in California, traveling on a shoestring budget. So these two young men approached me and said, you know, there's a, a dinner, a free dinner at this house in, in Washington Heights in San Francisco. Why don't you come? It's a community, there's people of all sorts there. So I went to the dinner and they were talking about community, about people working together. It was all very idealistic. They convince Gordon to stay for a workshop, then a weekend, then a longer workshop at the rural Boonville, California farm. And, and I'd have to keep adjusting as, I, as time went on. Because after the first weekend, they, they, and they said, well, why don't you stay the full week? They said, then you'll really understand and it could be the opportunity of a lifetime you could miss out on if you don't do it. Gordon stays. The schedule is exhausting. It's all part of the thought reform techniques. It was a really intense group environment. Um, people were very friendly, but you know, you, you had to follow a schedule. You'd go from the lecture to the group session and back to the lecture and, and then to uh, uh, playing a game called dodgeball where you throw balls at each other for a little while. Then you go back to the lecture and so on. And very little free time. And also you were supposed to always stick with the person who brought you, the, the person who's already a member, and not spend much time talking to other new guests. Gordon falls victim to the mind control technique known as love bombing. The real hook was that they kept praising me, making me feel I was an important part of the group and that I had something important to contribute. So I would feel that I'd be kind of rude or selfish if I quit. 
and I did have at, at certain points along the way a firm de decision I'm gonna leave here I got to get out this isn't right but each time they would just sort of wheedle me along until I finally said yeah all right I'll stay a little longer and 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 then gradually I, I was I was in <laughs> during the indoctrination it's not initially revealed that the group is actually the Unification Church. They had at one point over 300 front organizational names that weren't, many of which were not even religious. They called themselves the Creative Community Project, but really they were part of Reverend Moon's Unification Church, but they didn't say a word about Reverend Moon for the first uh, week, basically. You had to go through the full weeks long session. And then if you seemed to be receptive enough, then they'd tell you about Reverend Moon. And I was not receptive enough until I'd gone through that week long cycle three times. They don't necessarily convince you of the truth of their ideas, but they convince you that they might be true. So you better stick around just to be sure. And so you keep putting off leaving. The technique is to break you down and convince you that if you stay with it, you'll change the world. You would go through the three steps of coercive persuasion, which is first, unfreeze the person, break them down. Second, change them, download your program. And then third, lock them in, refreeze them. You were up at five in the morning and you were uh, doing all kinds of things that would seem unimaginable to me only a month before, like praying intensely out loud, everybody talking at once, uh, or standing in a circle going, glory to heaven and peace on earth, victory to true parents. You're too tired to think critically. You're getting worn out. And whenever there's any doubt in your mind, it's being washed away by these other people that are like a constant cheering section for the Unification Church morning, noon, and night. In fact, you can never get away from them to think for yourself. Yolande Brenner received similar indoctrination at a church center in London, England. When I first joined the church, I felt this amazing sense of ecstasy and bliss and that I had found the answer and they told me that within three years the world was going to be changed and everybody was going to be kind to everybody, there wouldn't be wars anymore, there would be love that would last forever, families that would last forever and uh, I felt this amazing sense of hope and I was 1000% in it. In the church, the Unification Church, you were taught to just ignore your doubts, to believe that they were actually coming from satanic influences or evil influences, like spirits. Spirits were whispering to you doubts and fears and making you think that you should leave. The main thing that was promised to me was that if I dedicated myself to God and working for the Unification Church for three years, that my brother who had become schizophrenic would become well. And this was always dangled like a carrot in front of me that if I gave myself to God, my brother would get better. What is dangerous about uh, the Unification Church is the way in which people lose control of their lives. And they surrender their decision-making to the leadership of the church, which can exploit people and take advantage of them financially and otherwise to their detriment and, and negatively impact their relationships with their family. Unification Church recruiters claim they are changing the world for the better, but for some recruiters, that effort will come with a difficult price to pay. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. In the 1970s, Reverend Sun Myung Moon brings his Unification Church to America, and thousands of followers give their entire lives over to his cause. The Moonies' dream is that their tireless efforts will make the world a better place. 
However, the reality is very different. Reverend Moon built of, of really a financial empire, and it was largely built by free labor. He had all of these people that were his followers that were at one time called Moonies. And so what they would do is they would go out fundraising and there would be thousands of them fundraising every day all across the United States. I just gave them whatever cash I had with me and I cashed in my plane fare and I gave them that money. And, uh, um, and after that I was, I was theirs to do as they wished. To start with, they would get you to go out on the street and witness, as they put it, to, in other words, bring in other people. So you'd go to the same tourist areas where I myself had been drawn in and you'd try to get people to say, yes, I'll go to this dinner. And other paths that pe members would take would be they would start selling flowers and candy. And I did do all that. I did do the selling of candy, um, costume, jewelry, the whole works. So. You're raising money for, for the church's operating expenses and ultimately for Reverend Sun Myung Moon. And a typical Mooney uh, might raise $200 a day. Now you multiply that times 5,000 active fundraisers and you can see how much cash that was. And there was a significant amount of cash flowing from Japan as well. Mary Jo Downey joins the Moonies in 1979 as a teenager. A church member picks her up when she's hitchhiking to work in Philadelphia. So I got in and he gave me a ride to my job, but on the way he started talking about the meaning of life. And I was, I don't know, 19, and I was very interested in this. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, I don't want to be mundane. I don't want, like, there's meaning to life. We don't want to live this ordinary life. Before long, she's in and ready to join the church workforce. It started out with selling flowers at streetlights. So what you do is you have a bucket of flowers, roses, and you go out and you show um, people stop at the light flowers. And some people would just like roll down the window and stick out the money. The Unification Church members during the 70s and, and the 80s uh, lived oftentimes in uh, apartments together. They would have houses that they would convert to churches and they would live there. And the living uh, standards could be pretty abysmal. I mean, a lot of people sleeping in the same room. It seemed to me that it was basically feed them cheaply, house them cheaply, get them out in a van, do the fundraising, maximize the profit over them. And if they get sick, get rid of them. I would say that it was part of their ideology, really. That if you don't keep yourself constantly busy, Satan can invade. So in the Unification Church, Satan invading means you get thoughts that are improper or that will pull you away from Father. Yolande Brenner is sent to New York City to hit the streets to recruit new members and sell trinkets. Uh, we used to say it was for uh, homeless children or some people said for starving children. And that was one of the big struggles I had at the beginning because I knew that I wasn't really going to homeless or starving children, but I justified it by saying that everybody in the world was homeless or starving because we didn't have a true home and we didn't have the nourishment of true love. So I found a way to work around it. Reverend Moon uses the enormous inflow of cash and free labor to build a massive financial empire. By 1974, the church is raking in over $8 million a year. Eventually, Moon's personal net worth exceeds $600 million. The list of his business holdings is 71 pages long, including everything from media to manufacturing, automobiles to fishing vessels. At one time, Reverend Moon controlled one third of the American fishing fleet. And at one point, 50% of the wholesale sushi market in most major metropolitan areas like New York and Chicago. Moon is a vocal supporter of Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal. And he organizes God Loves Richard Nixon rallies. In 1976, the US Congress investigates Moon 
They believe he is conspiring with Korean intelligence, the KCIA, to buy influence in Washington. In 1982, in an effort to connect himself to American conservative politicians, Moon founds the Washington Times. The newspaper's ideological focus allows him to befriend Republican ex-presidents Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, all of whom later attend and speak at church events. He knew how to use those uh, connections for photo opportunities. Who would look at a photograph of Reverend Moon with a president of the United States or a former president and say, this is a man who has real power. And he used that. In the 1970s, church membership explodes. Moon holds gigantic rallies in American cities. He claims his rally in Washington, D.C. is attended by 300,000 followers. Often, as followers grow more enmeshed in Moon's operation, concerned family members try to talk sense into their loved ones. Moon squelches this kind of negativity and doubt. In the Unification Church, people would be told, when you doubt, that's Satan attacking you. So when you start to have those doubts or consider what maybe a family member is saying about dropping out of college and being a, a fundraiser for the Unification Church, instead of thinking, well, yeah, maybe I should really think about that, you're thinking, no, there, it's Satan. For spring break in 1980, Mary Jo Downey decides to attend a weekend workshop at a country house instead of going home. I'm awakened in the middle of the night and someone said, your mom's here to see you. So my mom had driven down from Vermont and this was like the middle of the night and she's outside. And I remember she was in her vehicle and she was sort of like, it was like she was almost menacing the people there. Like she was driving back and forth and sort of revving her engine. And she was obviously really upset. And she said, are you gonna stay here or are you gonna come home with me? I didn't know what to say. And finally, I just, I said, I'm just gonna stay. And that's what I did. So I just felt so conflicted, but I felt like I did the right thing because she didn't understand. And I thought, I don't know if these people are right, but what if they are? Reverend Moon's techniques are strategically designed to eliminate doubt. Is he now in total control of the Moonies' minds? Followers of Sun Myung Moon generate millions of dollars for his unification church. They are willing to give up their lives and loved ones for their true parents, Reverend Moon and his wife. Any doubts are overcome by the powerful mind control techniques. When Mary Jo Downey hears Reverend Moon speak, she's surprisingly unimpressed and confused by his message. And I, I, I kept thinking, I don't get it, but there's so many people around me who are getting it. I want to know, I want to get it too. I want to see if I can understand this. Because if it's true, I don't want to miss out on this. Relationships are also challenging for many church members. Reverend and Mrs. Moon will be officiating this uh, wedding ceremony. And uh, Reverend Moon has matched me to Robert Bocconi from Czech, Czech Republic, who is here. Who are... You keep finding out things as you go along. So, well, what about men and women dating and all that. Well, it gradually became clear to me they didn't do that. <laughs> men and women were, were kept in separate quarters and you weren't even supposed to really talk about that, uh, about attachments or desires or, or anything. Mm -hmm. Being met by Reverend Moon and then having my spouse next to me, that's wonderful. Wonder yeah, I feel very happy. Moon personally would choose your partner, Moon himself, would, would point to someone in the crowd and say, you and you. Supposedly, I had original sin and inherited sin, but blessed members had been purified. They didn't have any sin. They were just 100% pure. You could marry someone, you'd be matched with someone by the church, and you might not even know them. Uh, you might actually meet them on your wedding day. And then people would pay fees to the Unification Church to be married by its leader. 
Reverend Moon. They might not consummate their marriage and they would be shipped off to various locations of the Unification Church. In 1992, Yolande is chosen to be blessed. On August 25th, 30,000 Mooney couples gather in Olympic Stadium in Seoul, South Korea. She first met her husband the day before on the flight from New York to Seoul. She becomes a born-again virgin by drinking a thimble full of grape juice in the holy wine ceremony. Moon's speech lasts over three hours, and then he offers the vows. The couples respond, yeah, Korean for yes. After that, we had the indemnity ceremony, which is where we were supposed to get rid of all our frustrations and resentment towards the opposite sex. In 1976, Congress begins looking into a massive covert KCIA operation designed to sway U.S. policy towards South Korea. The investigation finds that the Moon organization is likely a political tool of the Korean spy agency and has systematically violated U.S. tax, immigration, banking, currency, and Foreign Agents Registration Act laws. In 1982, the U.S. government takes a hard look at Moon's finances. Moon is tried and sentenced to 18 months in prison for tax evasion, making false statements, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. Moon insists that his actions are protected by freedom of religion. After losing appeals all the way to the Supreme Court, Moon is sent to Danbury Federal Prison in July 1984. He serves 13 months of an 18-month sentence in a federal prison and is fined $15,000. But even prison can't stop Reverend Moon's crusade to achieve world domination. Reverend Sun Myung Moon claims to be the new Messiah, and his Unification Church attracts thousands of followers around the globe. But over time, Moon's true goals are called into question. In 1984, he is convicted of tax evasion and serves 13 months in prison. His followers perceived this as persecution. It wasn't tax fraud. It was about, oh, he's being persecuted. He's, he's, he's being crucified. This is a terrible thing. When he's released from prison, he continues to build his financial empire thanks to the tireless efforts of the obedient church members. Moon returns to his lavish lifestyle. His opulent estate features a bowling alley, six pizza ovens, and a waterfall in the dining room. He publicly condemns gambling but meanwhile takes his entourage to Las Vegas and has assistants place bets for him. In the mid-1990s, Moon begins investing heavily in South America, supporting anti-communist regimes and buying huge swaths of property. By the end of 1994, he pours over $150 million into Uruguay, building the country's first luxury hotel and buying one of its leading banks, the second largest newspaper, and two of the largest printing plants. Then, Moon sets his sights on Brazil and purchases a 74,000-acre property in the Pantanal region, a vast area known for its extraordinary beauty. He plans to build his heaven on Earth, called New Hope Ranch. Here, Moon would have absolute dominion Moon claims the project will eventually be larger than England. New Hope will be the modern-day Garden of Eden. Reverend Moon named it because he wants this place to be the, as pristine and as natural as, as it was the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were created by Heavenly Father. According to the church, it will have an airport big enough for wide-body jets and millions of acres of fertile land. The church says that it plans to teach Brazilians new farming methods and unite the region's mostly Catholic population 
with the Unification Church. People on the farm hope that Moon, now in his 80s, will spend his last years in Brazil. From here, he can communicate with his 200 other projects around the world. But the authoritarian grip Moon holds over his flock leads many to question his motives in South America. And many claim his church is really just a cult. A destructive cult has three core characteristics, which I, I would call the nucleus for a definition of a destructive cult. Number one, an absolute authoritarian leader who is the defining element and driving force of the group. Number two, that that leader and that group uses coercive persuasion to gain undue influence over its members. And number three, that if the group is destructive, that they hurt people, that they do harm. They utilize undue influence to exploit people. It can be free labor, uh, financial exploitation, sexual uh, abuse, physical abuse, medical neglect, and then it can escalate to criminal behavior and violence. Many members recognize the coercive techniques that lured them in. But Lisa Cohn takes a very different route into the Unification Church. It grows from a tumultuous childhood. Her relationship with the Moonies begins when Lisa is just 10 years old. My parents uh, were really young. They got pregnant with my brother, got married, uh, got pregnant with me. They were in their early 20s. They were 20 when they had me. Um, and so it was the 60s. They were hippie parents. It was the craziness that entails. They split up when I was about three. We lived with my mom in East Orange, New Jersey. Uh, encounter groups, primal screaming, macrobiotic diet, drugs, all that stuff going on. Of God. Then Lisa's mother, Mimi, is invited to hear Reverend Moon speak. And she came back and she's like, this is amazing. He's amazing. I always knew Jesus wasn't supposed to die. This is the truth. This is incredible. Lisa's mom attends the seminars, and soon she's excited to take her kids to a church event. It's being held 100 miles upstate at Moon's idyllic theological seminary in Barrytown, New York. And my mom, she had just been very lost. So when she's driving us up there, she's saying, this is the best thing ever. Here's the Messiah. Here's the Messiah. Here's the Messiah. I just remember as being big and powerful and charismatic and kicking and thumping his hands and waving his hands as he spoke and it was just powerful and inspiring. I just remember thinking, wow, I just remember him, I just knew him as the Messiah. I was in awe. Mimi makes the radical decision to leave home and stay at the church center. So Lisa and her brother Robbie go to live with their father in New York City. He lived the pure hippie, bartender, sex, drugs, lifestyle. During the week, Lisa and Robbie live under their dad's hedonistic lifestyle. On weekends, they visit their mom in the strict church setting, and they even become playmates with Reverend Moon's kids. Throughout middle school and high school, Lisa completely buys into the church theology. It was preached around us. If everybody who's an adult tells you it's true, then you know it's you know it's true so yeah uh, from the day one he was my messiah and i absolutely believed everything everything i was taught as lisa reaches college she begins to separate herself from the church but it's a tortured transition so my mom got married on july 1st 1982 in madison square garden with 2075 couples everybody i knew just about was getting married I knew that I had been supposed to do that. I no longer wanted to do that. It was the most surreal, painful, weird, guilt-ridden, shame. Like I, at that point, I hated to see anybody in the church because I was so ashamed of the choice I'd made. Lisa attends Cornell University. The campus famously has bridges over deep gorges. Lisa looks over the edge and considers the worst. I still knew that Reverend Moon was the Messiah and I I just didn't I didn't want to do it anymore and but the feeling of walking away from everybody I knew and loved, walking away from the truth, letting God down, how 
the shame with that, um, the guilt. And so standing on the bridge, it would have been easier to die than to make that choice, than to choose to leave. Lisa doesn't attempt suicide, but she turns to cocaine, anorexia, and destructive relationships. I look back now and I think I was punishing myself for failing, right? If I wasn't gonna die by the bridge, there was a lot of other ways I could kill myself inside. And that's what I was doing, because that's how hard it is to leave. Mary Jo Downey suffers her own painful experiences, enduring steadfast allegiance to the Unification Church. In 1997, she receives the blessing in a huge church wedding ceremony at RFK Stadium, but her eternal partner is not what she envisions. Over time, he told me that in addition to being alcoholic, which never goes away, he um, was bipolar, he had been diagnosed as bipolar, he was hospitalized once for it, but he wouldn't accept treatment. He had been a heroin addict for years in the church. And he had, he had an explosive anger problem. So he would just get out of control. He'd be so furious that he would do things that were dangerous. And I was, I did not know what to do with that because being just an average person, I did not know how to deal with mental health issues with multiple issues like that. I had no idea. There was no way I could. The church is aware of the problems, but they simply advise Mary Jo to work harder on their relationship. The church leader's wife was telling me, when he comes home from work, you know, take his hand and tell him what a good job he does. The couple has a daughter together, but the relationship never improves. One time my ex-husband attacked me when I was going down a hallway and he put a strap around my neck and pushed me up against the wall. And I just, I actually went to the police, but I couldn't press charges. I could not do it. And the officer looked so like sad, you know, like, come back. He said, I will do it. And I just, I couldn't. The Unification Church has Mary Jo Downey and her young daughter trapped in an abusive, violent relationship. But what she does next surprises even herself. The Unification Church of Sun Myung Moon sets up thousands of people in massive wedding ceremonies. They put together complete strangers who often find something very different from their expectations of a happy and sinless life. Mary Jo Downey is locked in such a marriage. Despite the promises of the church, the violent, abusive relationship continues hurling down a dangerous path. I considered an intervention that my husband would straighten out and then we'd reconcile. And then over time, I started going to a domestic violence counselor and I started reading things. And I said, I don't want to be reconciled. I don't want to do this. this I've reached the point that I can't do it anymore. Mary Jo eventually escapes the relationship, and there are no apologies from the Unification Church. Reverend Moon, as the Messiah, can never be wrong. And I would see him, in my opinion, as a very narcissistic, uh, self-obsessed individual that was all about himself, his ego, his fulfillment. And many uh, cult leaders have been described that way, as megalomaniacs, as deeply narcissistic people, even malignantly narcissistic. Eventually, Gordon Newfeld comes to this realization about Reverend Moon and feels his own life is going nowhere. I wish I could get those years back. I wish I could have. There were several opportunities along the way where I could have quit. Why didn't I do it then? So you wish, wish you could go back and change those things. But quitting an organization like this is extremely difficult. But I did ask myself, well, what would it take for me to finally say enough? And I felt like, well, the only way I could get to that point where I'd say it's enough is if I felt like that the, 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 my alternative is suicide. Fortunately, Gordon is able to make the break after 10 years as a Mooney. I guess that is one of the things you regret after leaving a group is 
you realize, oh, I thought I was changing the world and I was actually making it worse. I thought I was helping, but I was not. <laughs> Lisa Cohn has been out of the church for decades, but it still influences her life. I did not join of my own free will, right? It was, it was given to me. And so when you're born and or raised and it, it pickles your brain and carves you in such unique ways, and it becomes very hard to separate yourself and to figure it out because it's so, you don't know what's you and you don't know what's the cult. I wasn't physically abused that I remember in the church. There weren't awful things that happened, but it obviously scarred me. But let me tell you really clearly, it is a cult. It is dangerous. It is intoxicating. It is extremely difficult to leave. Yolande Brenner's blessed marriage also fails. But worse yet for her is the promised cure for her brother's mental illness that never materializes. And the church leaders blame her. One of my central figures told me that it was my fault, that my brother was mentally ill, and that it was because of the evil spirits around me. And I felt really bad uh, because I felt like the whole purpose for me giving up my life was false and he wasn't going to get better. And that was the thing that made me feel even worse was that when my brother st first started to become mentally ill, he came to me and told me that I was the only person that could make him better and that being with me was the only thing that would make him better. I still feel like it was a terrible failure. In 2012, Sun Myung Moon dies at the age of 92. And his wife and children take over. His family has been plagued with scandal for years. Drug abuse, infidelity, illegitimate children, and financial excess. But nevertheless, the Unification Church continues. It's very much around. It's, it's different. It's being run by another generation, but it's very much an authoritarian organization that is very rich and still quite powerful. You're not yourself, but you're in a different milieu where you're thinking differently, and you think, it's almost like possibility thinking, and you think, yes, this sounds really good. It's almost like going to Vegas. Like you're a different person when you go to Vegas. It's almost like you step into a whole different world and I realized that I just wasn't even wanted. That I just decided, okay, this isn't the answer. These aren't perfect families. These aren't perfect leaders. This isn't really a true family. And I've been believing this and I gave up everything to do this for 15 years. And actually it was all a lie. Often when people look at destructive cults, they say it can only impact people who are susceptible. But the lure may be more powerful than that. Well, when I left the Unification Church, the only qualification I could readily put into the job marketplace was I, I knew how to type. So I learned to be a word processing operator and I got working uh, in, as a legal assistant and so on. I feel like I could have done a lot more than that if I hadn't been sidetracked for so long. And then there's anger that they would manipulate people and, and, and make them throw away their dreams. And then there's, you feel bad about the people who are still there. In a cult or an extreme situation, you have absolute certainty. It is the most intoxicating drug ever. You have purpose, you know exactly what you hear, what you need to do, what God needs you to do, and you have a community like you'll never find anywhere else. So it, it fulfills all your needs as a human, so who wouldn't want that? Even when it's wrong, right? But who wouldn't want it? Yeah. 